Can I be heard? All good? Um, thank you all for being here. Um, and thank you to everybody who's participated. It's been a really inspirational uh, couple of days for me. And it's uh, truly a privilege to stand here before you. Um, just a couple of things about uh, my background. I've just started at the University of Glasgow, and I'm working on a uh, translation of uh, Benjamin Fondad's Rencontre um, avec Leon Chestov, Meetings with Lev Shestov. Um, and uh, prior to that, my background is in politics and international relations, and more recently, modern European philosophy. I uh, completed a master's last year. This is all to sort of say that um, I'm at the very beginning of a new project, and none of my research really lined up too specifically with the themes of this conference, but I still wanted to contribute something. So I uh, hastily assembled uh, the paper that you were uh, about to hear, and I hope that you'll find it interesting. So I'd like to explore the tension between faith and reason in the philosophy of Lev Shestov focusing in particular on his dialogue with the historian of philosophy, Étienne Gilson, in Athens and Jerusalem. Gilson asks in his own book, L'Esprit de la Philosophie Médiévale, how a Judeo-Christian philosophy could have been possible. The key tension for Gilson, according to Shestov, is that A, Judeo-Christian philosophy has biblical revelation as its source, and B, the only philosophy worthy of the name is one that makes claims that are demonstrably true. So this paradox is unpacked in the third part of Athens and Jerusalem in a chapter entitled on the, on the Philosophy of the Middle Ages. Shestov presents Jusson's essential ideas as such, quote, without the ancient philosophy which set out from self-evident truths discovered by natural reason, medieval philosophy would not have existed. And without medieval philosophy, which assimilated to itself the Bible's revelations, there would not have been any modern philosophy. However, while Shestov agrees with Gilson's broader historical narrative of a seamless continuation of philosophical development guided by an attempt to reconcile the poles of Athens and Jerusalem, reason and faith, he argues that this process has only occurred through the exclusion or obfuscation of certain thinkers and or key elements of their thought at each of the three stages of European intellectual history that he identifies the ancient, the medieval, and the modern. First, the Greek tradition produces Plotinus, who Shestov argues is both the culmination of this tradition as well as the subversion of it. Agreeing with the philosopher and theologian Edward Zeller, Shestov argues that Plotinus loses confidence in the eternal truths produced by philosophic thought, ultimately seeing them as constrictive rather than emancipatory. Knowledge does not liberate the human spirit in this account. Rather, it enslaves it to necessity. According to Shestov, this constraint becomes unbearable for, for Plotinus, who instead seeks salvation outside of knowledge, beyond reason and thought. So it's here that Plotinus breaks with the tradition of ancient thought. But the consequence of this, in Shestov's view, is that the ancient philosophy decays in his wake. Shestov argues, and I quote, human thought then congealed into immobility and sank into endless commentaries on what had already been done instead of going forward at its own risk and peril towards the puzzling unknown of which Plotinus had spoken. This attempt to soar above knowledge leaves no trace in history, according to Shestov. As he says, most historians are interested in Plotinus so long as they find in him the customary argumentation which convinces everyone and which rests on the omnipotence of necessity. Though ignored by later generations, it is the cultivation of rootlessness that Shestov argues is Plotinus' greatest philosophical contribution. So returning to Gilson, we ask, how is the seemingly paradoxical synthesis of Judeo-Christian philosophy possible? According to Shestov, the goal of medieval philosophy is to support and ground the revealed truth. In Gilson's interpretation, which Shestov broadly agrees with, medieval philosophers essentially read the Bible through the lens of the Greeks. The truths of revelation are filtered through reason. Quote, everything that the Middle Ages read in the Bible, or read in the Bible, was refracted through these truths. Shestov argues all truths are verified according to the Greek tradition of reason, and crucially that, quote, the truths of revelation do not enjoy any special privilege in this respect. The consequence of this is that biblical truth is transformed into allegory and metaphor in order to bridge the gap between Athens and Jerusalem. Faith is thus subject to the control of reason in St. Augustine. 
And the truth that has been proven is greater than the truth that hasn't, according to St. Paul. Faith becomes a substitute for rather than a kind of knowledge. For the medieval thinkers, the apostle contends themselves with faith, whereas the philosopher seeks and finds proofs. Further consequences abound, for it is not just the philosopher that must submit to reason, but God as well. Shestoff writes, I think it would be difficult to find anything better than what Plato says in the Phaedo and in the Euthyphro about reason and morality. There is no greater misfortune for man, we read in the Phaedo, than to become a hater of reason, a mislogos. The holy is not holy because the gods love it, but it is precisely because the holy is holy that the gods love it, says Socrates in the Euthyphro. So it's not just truth, but also morality that is an independent of and above God, which has the added consequence of truth and virtue being conflated. Socrates could not have allowed for the gods to be free of morality because as Shestoff articulates the position, quote, a god who is beyond morality is not a god but a monster. The medieval inherits this framework to interpret the Bible, and it is this move to confine the Judeo-Christian God in medieval philosophy that John Duns Scotus and William of Ockham attack. Scotus and Ockham do not seek of reason any justification of what the revealed truth has brought, nor do they accept the Socratic autonomy of morality. In contrast to the Euthyphro, Scotus says, quote, that everything is good because God wills it and not the other way around. This move makes God, quote, the source and master of all laws and rules, and therefore beyond morality and necessity. Faith, in this case, is not a substitute for knowledge. Shestoff cites Scotus, quote, on the theories, oh, rather, on theories rests, on theories rest the credibilia, things to be believed, through which or to the assumption of which reason is compelled, but which are more certain for the Catholic through the fact that they do not rely on our blinking and in most things vacillating understanding but firmly on thy most solid truth. Shestoff cites similar passages in Ockham. And so the articles of faith are not principles of proof or conclusion, and they are not probable because to all or to most or to the wise they appear false. And in accepting this, they become wise for the wise of the world, and especially adherents of the natural reason. However, as with Plotinus, Shestoff argues that these versions of Ockham and Scotus are not the ones found in our history. And as with Greek philosophy, in the wake of its subversion under Plotinus, medieval philosophy also dies, incapable of confronting the groundlessness exposed by these thinkers. As a result, Duns Scotus and Ockham are remembered selectively, the likes of Tertullian are ignored, and Luther is denied the name of philosopher altogether because of a similar rejection of the synthesis of these poles. I'd, uh, I'd hope to elaborate a little bit more on Tertullian and, and uh, Luther. Uh, Tertullian's going to have to wait for the time being, but Marina will, will ad address a bit more on, on Luther. Um, so, continuing. For Shestoff, the consequence of the historical philosophical inability to confront groundlessness crystallizes around the standard philosoph philosophical reading of the fall. In his view, a fundamental misinterpretation of the story leads philosophers to focus on the perceived act of Adam's disobedient, disobedience in eating from the tree of knowledge, rather than accepting at face value God's statement that knowledge itself would lead to death. It is not disobedience, but knowledge that hides death in itself. This focus on Adam's sin will ultimately lead philosophy further away from the actual content of the Bible, while simultaneously reaffirming its authority. As Shestoff puts it, quote, the more men occupied themselves with the authority of the Bible, the less they took account of the content of the sacred book. For Shestoff, the medieval philosophers are unaware they're committing the same act as the first man, the same dissatisfaction, the same fear of the arbitrariness of God that leads Adam to eat from the tree of knowledge, leads the philosopher to retreat from groundlessness. The fall enslaves us to necessity, and through an attempt at reconciling the poles of reason and faith, we find ourselves worshiping them as they are above God, or at least independent of but for Shestoff, this means, and I quote, human the human groans, curses, and supplication must be silent before the unchangeable principle of being. Hegel embodies the modern philosopher in the implicit belief that it is, it is the serpent and not God who spoke the truth. And this also allows for um, a continuous narrative about the historical development of philosophy, which is again embodied best in its modern variant in the work of Hegel, if you think about the... Uh, you know, historical progress leading to the absolute. Furthermore, 
if for Kant, the greatest modern philosopher, the concept of a supreme being destroys all possibility of philosophy, then there is no place for the god of Duns Scotus in the modern era. Instead, convinced it has reconciled Athens and Jerusalem, the moderns promote a universalizing philosophy of objective truth that, according to Shestoff, subsumes and ultimately negates the individual. However, as with the ancient and medieval eras, Shestoff identifies dis dissenting voices in the work of Dostoevsky, Nietzsche, and Kierkegaard, three thinkers who refuse to recognize the eternal truths of the philosophic tradition. In The Grand Inquisitor from the Brothers Karamazov, Dostoevsky, like Shestov, also identifies the absurd and contradictory development of a religious authoritarianism that finds itself increasingly divorced from the content of the Bible. Even more pertinent, however, is the narrator's rejection of self-evident truth in Notes from Underground, that twice two makes four is not life but is the beginning of death, is picked up by Shestov in order to illustrate the opposition between knowledge and life, linking it back to the story of the fall. This opposition between rationality and faith is the central theme of not only Athens and Jerusalem, but of the existential critique of reason itself. Dostoevsky is a key ally for Shestov in this critique, arguing that, quote, he sees in the self-evidences of our thought only an enchanted, only an enchantment, only a stupefaction of the spirit. Shestov believes philosophy to be an ex expression of personal anguish and that a moment of tragic devastation lies at the core of each of the thinkers that appear in his work. Dostoevsky's harrowing experience of a mock execution, followed by his years in penal servitude in Siberia, would instill a traumatic wound, a collapse of rational certainties, leaving him grasping for something beyond the strangling necessity of certain death. Shestov's reading of Nietzsche radically departs from conventional interpretations of him as merely an anti-Christian or a sort of arch-atheist. Instead, he claims that Nietzsche is a God-seeker who is criticizing religious dogma and the idolatrous identification of God with the moral law in a similar vein as Dostoevsky does in The Grand Inquisitor. In Dostoevsky and Nietzsche, The Philosophy of Tragedy, Shestov positions Nietzsche's thought along with Dostoevsky's war against evidence and ethical certainty, as embodied in The Underground Man, in order to oppose the classical idealism of Kant and Hegel. Shestov presents Nietzsche as desperately seeking faith in the morality of an omnipotent ally, but ultimately fa failing to find it. This failure prompts him to confront the groundlessness beneath his feet, to stare into the abyss, and insist we must face it in all of its horror in order to move beyond good and evil. Thus spoke Zar Zarathustra, and Nietzsche's, sorry, thus spoke Zarathustra is Nietzsche's constructive attempt following the destructive reevaluation of values in much of his other work. One of Nietzsche's key aphorisms in the work, The Vision and the Enigma, includes a parable about a young shepherd biting off and spitting out the head of a serpent that crawled down his throat in his sleep. This action turns the shepherd into a free and immortal being, which func functions as a metaphor uh, of the overcoming of knowledge and original sin. As an aside, I first read that aphorism a couple of years ago, and I couldn't begin to make sense of it. And, uh, when I was just working on this in the last couple of weeks, it dawned on me, and I had a moment of clarity, which was, uh, which was quite wonderful. So if you're if you're new to this uh, and and feel baffled in these moments, there is there is a light further down the tunnel. I hope. Um, finally, Kierkegaard argues that, uh, as Shestov puts it, quote, the essential opposition between the Greek philosophy and the Christian philosophy comes from the fact that the former has as its source wonder and the latter despair. Greek philosophy leads us to reason and knowledge, but Christian philosophy begins at the end of all possibility, not in wonder, but in the despair that grips us when the rational is fully exhausted and we are left staring down the barrel of a gun, quite literally for Dostoevsky. There is nowhere to turn but the absurd. This leads Kierkegaard to reject one of the modern era's quintessential public, quote, Christian, Christian philosophers, Hegel, in favor of the private thinker Job. Shestov's project is strikingly similar. Like Kierkegaard, he wants to return to faith the position that it had occupied in the Bible. Shestov opposes the Catholic doctrine of salvation through works, arguing instead for salvation through faith alone. Faith for Shestov is audacity in the face of necessity. His God is not the God of philosophers, but the God of Abraham. In the introduction to his English language translation of Athens and Jerusalem, Bernard Martin describes Shestov as stubbornly anti-modern, arguing that, quote, the gods of the 19th and 20th century man, science, 
technology, the idea of inevitable historical progress, autonomous ethics, and most of all, rationalist systems of philosophy were, were for him idols, devoid of ultimate meaning, but terrible in their potentiality for destruction. It is impossible to overstate how seriously Shestov takes this claim or this idea. An encounter with uh, Martin Buber and Shestov, recounted in uh, Benjamin Fontan's, Fontan's memoirs, Meetings with Lev Shestov, underscores this point. Buber, lamenting the rise of Hitler and the failure of the emancipatory project of communism, alludes to the biblical tree of knowledge, stating that it is as though we human beings are trying to kill the serpent. For Buber, it is our abandoning of the fruit Adam picked from the tree of knowledge that has brought us to this moment of crisis. But Shestov responds, and that is exactly what is necessary. And so day and night for years now I fight nothing but the serpent. What is Hitler next to the serpent of knowledge? This startling statement may initially appear to trivialize the rise of fascism, a fact made even more disturbing if one is aware that Fondan, Shestov's sole disciple in his lifetime, would himself be murdered in Auschwitz only a few years later. And just as an aside, when I initially read about this encounter, I, I found the statement you know, deeply offensive. However, Shestov understands the fall as bringing temporal irreversibility into being and suffering and death as its consequences. The aim of his response to Buber is to put the problem into perspective in order to give it its proper significance in the history of human thought. Indeed, both Shestov and Fondan view the rise of fascism as the product of an excess of rationalism rather than an absence of it. Bruce Bao summarizes the position by arguing that in both Fondan and Shestov's view, Nazism is a manifestation of rationalism that is, quote, at last honest and consistent in its negation of the individual human existence in favor of some grand abstract idea, in this case, the idea of race and that the Nazis used irrational elements such as myth as a means to a rational end. It's not too difficult to think of parallel examples in our own political moment. Fondan, like his mentor Shestov, insists we must choose between either a rational philosophy, which ultimately leads to resignation in the face of necessity, or existence by means of an audacious faith that refuses these constraints and projects itself towards the groundlessness of a limitless freedom that dares to believe the impossible in the face of the inevitable.